I'd like to welcome you to our phosphorus research site. Um, and uh, we're here in the Lebo area of Manitoba, where we have about 40 acres that is quite phosphorus deficient and a terrific place for us to learn how to manage phosphorus in organic systems. Now behind me is uh, a typical uh, forage crop that you would see uh, in the prairies. Um, it's got alfalfa in it, um, uh, orchard grass, a little bit of timothy, and this stand is 10 years old. And this is uh, the kind of situation that farmers sometimes find themselves in. They say, well, I've got this, this uh, old hay stand and uh, you know it hasn't had chemicals for a long time. I'm going to convert this to organic. And uh, you know it's had uh, legumes, so it should have nitrogen. And um, and if the field was managed as a hay crop with the nutrients being exported and no manure coming back in, these fields can be incredibly phosphorus deficient. And that's exactly what we find here. This whole area has phosphorus between three and about six parts per million. And we've even measured as low as two parts per million. That's extremely low. And so what happens is farmers break up a stand like this, uh, they get their land certified organic, they grow a crop of wheat and it's terrible. Um, it's very disappointing. Um, and the reason is uh, oftentimes uh, that there's a serious phosphorus deficiency. And so that's what we want to talk about today is how do we bring uh, nutrients into organic crop production. So the the ways that we're going to highlight, uh, we are going to talk about not only phosphorus, we're also going to talk about nitrogen. So we're going to talk about green manure crops. Uh, the second thing is we're going to talk about bringing manure in uh, to uh, um, overcome the phosphorus deficiency. So uh, we'll go around and look at a number of strategies right here at the research site. One of the fundamental things about an organic crop rotation is to start with a good green manure crop. Um, that, that is really so important. And that's what we're looking at here. This is uh, uh, not an unusual type of green manure. It's a combination of oats and 40-10 forage peas um, and some weeds and also some soybeans in here. So we've added soybean to this green manure because here in the eastern Manitoba region it can sometimes be wet and soybeans are uh, more flooding tolerant than peas. And of course one of the things that we grow these legumes for is for their nitrogen. So you can see in this, uh, in the case of this soybean plant, there's some very nice nodules uh, on the root and um, and I think everybody's familiar with the process of nitrogen fixation and these legumes will bring the, the nitrogen from the atmosphere into the uh, nodules and then into the soil. <clears throat> so the green manure is very fundamentally important for the nitrogen part of the cropping system. And, and we know that green manures uh, that grow well, and this one is growing pretty well, uh, they can make anywhere from 60 to you know, 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, which is similar in pounds per acre. Um, and so they're a really important fundamental part of the rotation to add nitrogen to the system. Um, w one of the things that I should just mention uh, here this year, it's very dry and there's a lot of uh, cattle farmers in the area who are looking at this and saying, I'd like to take this for green feed. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's one of the other nice things about a green manure. If you have, um, if you have a crop like this and you need uh, high quality feed, you can cut it for green feed. And that's actually what's going to happen with this green manure this year. Uh, because we have a, quite a bit of nitrogen in the soil already and we don't need this green manure for the nitrogen. Uh, but when we cut this off, it means that we're removing most of the nitrogen. So this green manure crop, um, if we harvest it for silage or hay, we're going to be taking most of the nitrogen off. But anyways, I just wanted you to see a typical green manure and to make the point that the green manures are very fundamental uh, in adding nitrogen to the rotation. When we think about adding phosphorus to uh, organic farming systems, we often think about using uh, livestock manure. And, uh, and there are other options, which we're going to get to in a minute, but uh, we have a, an experiment here uh, where we've looked at um, breaking up a forage stand and then trying to grow organic grain crops in it. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, in 2015, in the fall, we added 
three different levels of nutrients to this plot. Uh, we added the equivalent of um, about 30 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. Uh, we added 100 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. Those are both using composted beef cattle manure. And we also added 100 kilograms of uh, ammonium phosphate, uh, equivalent phosphorus. Um, and, um, and the plot I'm standing in here uh, is, the check, is one of the check plots. And it has never had any nutrients added. Um, so just a brief history, this was in alfalfa for about seven years. We were harvesting the alfalfa for hay and uh, removing those nutrients, not bringing anything back. And then we broke it up thinking, oh, we're going to have a great organic crop and we've had terrible crops in this, uh, in this rotation. So the way the rotation went is we broke up uh, the alfalfa in 2015. We grew uh, in 2016. We had a green manure. Um, 17, 18, we had grain crops uh, in um, a pea crop in, seven, in uh, 18, and in, in last year we had a wheat crop in here, and then we're back to a green manure. And you can see the plot that I'm in. We've got a terrible green manure crop, and we've also grown terrible grain crops in here. We've got a lot of phosphorus deficiency showing up in the corn. And, uh, and uh, th this is actually very relevant to farmers because, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the short video, is that farmers, when they're faced with an old hay stand and wanting to shift that to organic uh, nutrient management is really important. So over here in this plot, and the plots are 4 meters wide by uh, 10 meters long, uh, this plot received the 30 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus in the form of composted beef cattle manure. Uh, back in 2015 and you can see we have a much better green manure. Uh, the peas are healthier, the barley is healthier, uh, the corn is not showing as much phosphorus deficiency and so the, the 30 kilograms of phosphorus in the manure have actually uh, been a real boost to this rotation. Uh, we're growing uh, quite good grain crops here and um, and this is a much more profitable system than over there where we have not added any nutrients at all. This plot is where we actually added 100 kilograms of phosphorus in the form of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. So we did that in the fall of 2015. Uh, so um, this, this is, could now be a certified organic field because that's a long time ago. Uh, but we put it in as a comparison. I'm going to show you the 100 kilograms of uh, phosphorus with beef cattle manure in a minute. Um, but w one of the things we see here is very good green manure growth. Uh, we also see some mustard, and mustard is an indication that we have enough phosphorus. And so uh, this strategy is a little different than the manure one. Um, it's using fertilizer and stocking the soil with fertilizer before we transition to organic. And it's a strategy that's worth considering. Okay, we're in the plot here where we added uh, a lot of composted beef cattle manure equivalent to 100 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. So behind me you can see uh, very good green manure, um, the corn looks healthy, and we also have some wild mustard. <laughs> so that gives an indication that we've got lots of phosphorus. Um, so uh, in this experiment, um, just to summarize, uh, in 2015 we added uh, either no manure, we added uh, 30 kilograms of phosphorus uh, with manure, we added 100 kilograms of phosphorus with manure, and the previous plot that I showed you was 100 kilograms of phosphorus with fertilizer. Uh, they're all legitimate transition strategies, and so that was in the fall of 2015. Here we are in 2020. Uh, we've grown, this is our fifth crop after we've uh, added the nutrients and uh, where we've added enough phosphorus, we're still growing a good system. So the point really here is to, is to demonstrate that when you're breaking up old alfalfa stands, uh, they may have a lot of nitrogen, but they can very easily be phosphorus deficient. And so that's why we're uh, just emphasizing uh, soil testing, uh, tissue testing, and if you have a deficiency, uh, you need to add nutrients to that system to make it a, a productive organic system. I'm here with uh, Michelle Karkner, a PhD student uh, in the Department of Plant Science at the University of Manitoba. Um, good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Martin. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions about what we're looking at here. Um, the, one of the points of this uh, short video is to talk about nutrient management in organic systems. 
and uh, apparently you're growing some wheat here. So uh, tell us about your nutrient management and uh, how these crops look. Yeah, so last year we uh, planted this area with a pea oat green manure. And when we did a soil test report, uh, soil test in the spring, we found that we were at about 114 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Okay, well that, that's quite a bit of nitrogen. Were you happy with that? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. I think a lot of organic farmers would be pretty happy with that level. Uh, unfortunately, we were at about 4 ppm of phosphorus. So um, uh, if you look at any of the Manitoba agriculture um, reports, like that's quite low in phosphorus for wheat production. Okay, so you ended up with a situation where you had quite adequate nitrogen, but you were short of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. So how did your crops grow in that circumstance? Well, I'm right behind me, we have um, a good example of a plot here. Uh, this is the variety Mackenzie. And this has um, like no manure, no added nutrients um, other than the green manure last year. And uh, you can see that it's a pretty poor stand of, uh, of wheat, um, especially since it's, uh, it's been quite dry uh, lately. So um, this Mackenzie, uh, you're saying that you're kind of disappointed given all that nitrogen, you know, um, this could have done a bit better. I, I'm disappointed and I think a lot of other, a lot of farmers would be disappointed as well, for sure. Okay, so um, what, could a farmer do about this situation where you've, uh, you know, you're growing wheat organically, you've got lots of nitrogen, but you're short of phosphorus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one option is actually to add um, composted manure. And I actually have another plot where we did actually add um, composted manure at about 25 pounds um, per acre. Oh, fantastic. Do you think we could go take a look at that? Yeah, let's go take a look. Okay, great. So we're standing in front of a plot of Mackenzie where I applied um, the equivalent of 25 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare or about 25 pounds of phosphorus per acre of um, composted manure and you can see that the um, the stand is quite a bit better than the one that we were um, um, standing in front of before. So. Right, it looks like a much higher yield potential. Would you say this is twice as high the yield potential or what would you, do you have any data to, you know, preliminary data to give us a guess here? Yeah, so at um, early stem elongation and at anthesis, I actually did some biomass sampling mm -hmm. and um, submitted the uh, tissue for phosphorus content uh, concentration and it was um, the low phosphorus was about 12.12 percent and the um, added manure was about um, 0.22 percent and so we're it definitely made a difference what about in terms of yield what's your estimate in terms of the higher yield potential with the composted manure oh i think it's most certainly will be uh, double for sure i think Okay, so so this is one strategy that farmers could use to um, uh, to improve the uh, situation here is add phosphorus through the use of uh, uh, cattle manure, and you know the results are pretty obvious here. Um, now, what about uh, genetic uh, improvement? Can variety or plant breeding also make the plants grow better under low phosphorus? Yes, actually, part of this project, um, the trial that we're looking at here, is looking at different breeding programs and how they've selected for phosphorus use efficiency. And so some of the lines in this trial were actually selected by organic farmers on organic farms, and oftentimes they are either low in phosphorus or the main source of their um, phosphorus uh, nutrients was under um, um, compost. And so... Okay, could you, uh, is there a farmer selected variety that you could show us here growing like with and without the manure? Yes, of course. So right beside you. Oh, oh here. Okay. Yes, right here. So this, uh, uh, this wheat was actually selected by an organic farmer in Quebec. Um, and so this plot has absolutely no um, extra manure added. It's the 4 ppm, 114 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and then over here... Well, wait a minute. So uh, just uh, so this variety has been selected 
under organic. Mackenzie, the other variety we looked at, I'm assuming is not selected under organic? No, this the Mackenzie was selected under um, a conventional breeding program, so it would have had all the conventional um, fertilizers and fungicides and herbicides added to it during the selection process. Okay, and looking at this uh, farmer selected line here, you're saying this had no composted manure? No compost. Okay. Did this, to your eye, does this look better than the no compost Mackenzie plot? Um, I would say it does look better than the no compost Mackenzie plot for sure. Okay. Yes. But you won't know until you do the actual yield and the statistics whether the farmer selection made a difference. Yes, precisely. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then you said you had this plot with uh, compost added? Yes, I do. Uh, it's actually quite close by, so we can just walk over. Okay, here. well, let's go take a look at that. So, right here, we have um, the same line as um, the plot that we just saw, but this one has composted manure added to it, the same rate as, uh, McKen as this Mackenzie plot. Okay, so that's, that's quite interesting. So, what we've learned here is that uh, even when you have high levels of nitrogen available to the crop yes. through a good green manuring program, you can have pretty lousy yields because of a phosphorus deficiency. Yeah, and I think it, it harks back to that um, law of the minimum um, uh, theory that Liebig had um, in the late 1800s that you can have uh, an abundance of one nutrient, but if you don't have the, um, the a partnering nutrient, then um, it can kind of stop the wheels short. That's a really good way to bring that theory, you know, into into practice here. Because we uh, now the other, I guess, question I have for you is: Were you surprised at the phosphorus response here? Because it seems to be quite strong, and we often hear that it's hard to get a phosphorus response in soils in Manitoba. Yeah, I actually because we. We applied the the, uh, the manure in the spring, actually right before planting, and so um, we were a little bit worried that we wouldn't see a phosphorus response, um, but we did. We brought the parts per million up to about eight um, by adding the manure. Okay, so you brought the parts per million up from adding about 25 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus in the manure from four to eight. Yes. Okay. And, um, and I, I think that makes me happy because we know that in organic agriculture when your soil phosphorus is above six, uh, you can usually grow some pretty good crops, but below six is a real critical. So are there any um, final thoughts you have for our viewing audience? Well, I guess um, it would be that the, around the excitement and draw your attention to the excitement around working with um, organic farmers within the breeding process, but, and also um, working within an organic system in the breeding process, whether it's with or without farmers. Um, and there's a lot of potential to select for things like phosphorus use efficiency by looking at different systems outside of the conventional context. And so hopefully um, this trial will um, help bring some attention to the benefits that uh, we can gain from working with farmers and under an organic context. Okay, so um, what you're, so are you saying that the farmers select these varieties on their farms? Is that actually what's happening? Yeah, so we have a breeder. Um, uh, in this case, uh, it was um, either Ann Kirk um, or Agriculture Canada. A breeder make a select um, a cross, and then we send those seeds out to the farmers um, when they are still quite genetically diverse. And then the farmers actually select um, the spikes um, that look the best uh, within the plot on their farm under their conditions. So it's very unique. Okay, and for how many years do the farmers do this? Yeah, so the farmers um, select the spikes and then uh, clean them and then grow them out and uh, they uh, repeat that three times. Okay, thank you very much Michelle. So a central part of uh, growing nutrients in an organic farming system is to grow a green manure or we could call it a green manure cover crop um, to you know, especially legume based to make nitrogen. Uh, I see that you're growing a cover crop here. Um, and could you tell us a little bit about why you're growing it and, and what's, what's actually growing here? So this cover crop is actually for the area that I'm going to put my low phosphorus trial in next year. Ah. 
Mm -hmm. And so the species that we decided to grow this year are barley, flax, uh, peas, uh, soybeans, and corn. Okay, so a five species mixture. Um, and is that better than a one species mixture? Yes, of course, because it's almost like insurance. So um, in a dry year you'll, or in a wet year, you have some insurance. Okay, um, I'm looking at the stand and it looks really healthy, um, but it's, it's kind of nice for me to see that there's not a lot of wild mustard. But um, uh, does that tell us anything about the phosphorus status of this soil? Um, well, mustard is a, a non-mycorrhizal crop, and so uh, oftentimes in organic systems, when the phosphorus is low, you don't often see a, a lot of wild mustard uh, because the uh, mustard hasn't been able to make that association with the fungi to access um, phosphorus very far away from its own roots. Okay, well that's interesting. So wild mustard might be an indicator species, mm -hmm. plus it, if we want to get rid of wild mustard, we can have a phosphorus deficiency. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting dilemma. Um, is there any other signal here telling you about the phosphorus status of this crop? And the reason I'm asking is if a farmer would grow this green manure, mm -hmm. they would think, boy, that, it's really growing well. So I'm going to grow a great wheat crop here next year. Um, what, what is the soil phosphorus today in the soil or now this year in the soil? And is there any other indicator that you may have a challenge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually we're standing in front of a, a, a corn plant that's um, showing some decent phosphorus deficiency. Okay. So you can tell that it's, it's deficient, deficient in phosphorus because of the purpling of the leaves. So this is a really um, great specimen. Uh, as an example. Okay, so that's, um, uh, is that why the corn was included here or is it just a happy coincidence that it helps us to tell that we've got a phosphorus deficiency? Um, it was partly why the corn was planted here, just so we can confirm. Uh, what is the, um, what is the soil test phosphorus in this soil? It's about three parts per million. Oh my, so it's even lower than over there. Okay, so are you surprised, I mean, I'm a little surprised that the legumes are growing quite well even though there's so little phosphorus. Are they better at getting phosphorus than wheat? Um, well, in some cases they are, and some legumes are actually able to acidify the rhizosphere, so the, a the area around the roots. Um, and when those um, legumes acidify the rhizosphere, they actually are able to access more um, phosphorus that might be bound up in different complexes in the soil. Okay, so, so what I've learned here is that, you know, on the surface, if I wasn't looking at this corn plant and if I didn't have that soil test, I might think there's going to be a lot of nitrogen here for the next year's crop, maybe similar to over there where you had over 120 or 110 kilograms of nitrogen. And, but I would be disappointed in the wheat crop because I have a phosphorus deficiency and wheat is just not that efficient at taking up phosphorus. So, did I get that right? Uh, yes, precisely. I don't think that uh, uh, you can always go by what your nitrogen um, status is, for, especially for a crop like wheat. That isn't as efficient at um, breaking up the phosphorus complexes in the soil at low phosphorus levels. Okay, well thank you very much. When we think about how to manage nutrients in an organic farming system, it's worth stepping back and reflecting on uh, how we use nutrients generally in our society. So if we look at, at something like phosphorus, for example, um, it is uh, phosphorus fertilizer is mined in selected places in the world and, and uh, made into fertilizer. Uh, the rock is treated chemically uh, to make it into available uh, plant available fertilizer. That fertilizer is spread on our farmlands um, it it uh, goes into our food, we consume it, we eliminate it, and then um, those eliminations become uh, uh, an environmental hazard. And in fact, um, agricultural um, uh, sewage runoff of phosphorus is a major problem in many water bodies uh, around the world. So uh, what we're dealing with in a lot of cases is a very linear uh, nutrient cycle, we mine it, we use it, we eliminate it, and so we kind of throw it away. And um, in organic farming, we can't use those mined fertilizers that are chemically treated. 
especially phosphorus. So um, we're thinking a lot about how we can make that nutrient uh, use into a cycle and we've certainly done that with the livestock sector we we look at at, at livestock manure uh, as a very precious resource in organic agriculture and we've looked at some plots here today uh, which have emphasized the importance of of uh, beef cattle manure as an example and there's other types of manures poultry hog manure other types of manure um, but uh, at the same time we're thinking uh, we have a limited amount of manure coming from livestock and um, and and uh, uh, when we think critically about where those nutrients that we're producing in agriculture are going they're going to humans so that brings us to the question of can we use uh, nutrients that come from human eliminations back into agriculture and can we use that in a way that's practical for organic farming and that's what the experiment behind me is doing and there are a number of graduate students here at the University of Manitoba who are looking at really novel uh, nutrients uh, from hu the human food chain uh, f uh, food source that come back into organic agriculture so the first one is called struvite and it is uh, it's like a, it's a white it looks like a, it's like a kidney stone it is a phosphorus um, and nitrogen uh, material that's precipitated out of uh, out of sewage sludge and that is now being done commercially in Canada and uh, it's not registered for organic at this point but there's a lot of interest and so one of the phosphorus treatments here uh, is struvite and uh, it is uh, the crops are very responsive to that struvite so we're taking those nutrients from humans and bringing it back into the agri into the food system um, and this so that, that that's one source um, the second source that we're looking at here is called a digestate and um, the digestate that we're using comes from southern ontario where municipalities are are required to collect uh, compost from uh, the kitchen scraps and things and they take that compost and they put it into an anaerobic digester where they generate methane which can be used to power a turbine for electricity or even be used in, in uh, transportation and then the leftover nutrients uh, are rich in you know phosphorus and nitrogen and other things because the methane only takes off carbon and hydrogen so the digestate is then dried and it's it's uh, sold as a pellet it, and that's another treatment that we're looking at in here um, and uh, and the third uh, uh, and th uh, the third nutrient coming from the human food stream uh, is actually an insect frass so the way that works is that um, uh, black soldier flies eat food waste and convert that food waste into high protein livestock feed in the form of the larvae but they also have their own eliminations that's called frass that's very nutrient rich and it's also a fertilizer that's being tested here in this organic work so this is the work of Jess Jessica Nixie and Jess Nixie is doing her master's degree in the soil science department at the University of Manitoba and uh, this is the second year of the study where she's looking at two wheat varieties uh, a shorter one and a taller one and looking at response to these nutrients that come out of the human food stream um, we call them anthronutrients because they come out of the human uh, experience and so these anthronutrients are a new and exciting way to think about bringing nutrients into an organic system to making it sustainable and it also has the benefit of keeping those nutrients out of the waterways and creating a more circular uh, food system so that brings us to the end of um, our session today where we uh, looked at nutrient management in organic systems at our LIBO site and if you have any questions, you can get a hold of me. The information is at the end of the video. Thank you very much.